Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we are talking to Dr. James Lindemer. James is the lichenologist at the New York Botanical Gardens. He also co-authored the new book, Urban Lichens, a field guide for Northeastern North America. Hi James, welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Thanks so much for having me, I really appreciate it. Oh yes, and I am so looking forward to this conversation. We've been talking already and a little bit before we start recording. And this is going to be a really great conversation. I can tell that. And it's about a topic that I don't know a lot about. So I get to learn too, which is always a good thing. I mean, any conversation about lichens is a good conversation because they're amazing. <laughs> and that's a lot of what we want to talk about. But before we start talking too much about the lichens themselves or your book, let's just take a couple of minutes to tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do. So yeah, I am the staff research lichenologist here at the New York Botanical Garden. And really what that means is that I study the lichens uh, wherever they may be. And for me, that's mostly in the Eastern United States and Eastern Canada, so most of Eastern North America. Over the years, I've done a lot of work all along the Atlantic coast of the United States. And then also a huge amount of work in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, especially in the Southern Appalachian Mountains in Western North Carolina and East Tennessee. And so, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in these areas really documenting and describing the lichens that grow there. And the reason for that is that we actually knew remarkably little about that. Uh, so, you know, lichens, despite the fact that they are these like huge things, well, they're maybe not, maybe not huge, huge, not quite the way to say it, but they're big. You can see them with your naked eye. They are not like amoebas. They are not like other, you know, they're not microbes. They're like flowers. I would argue they are bigger than many, many things. <laughs> um, but but they're pretty large and they're pretty conspicuous. And, uh, you know, there's something that people recognize for sure. Like, you know, anybody that goes out into the forest or goes out to any ecosystem <laughs> really is likely to see lichens and sort of wonder what they are. So it's just kind of amazing that they're, they're sort of the last big thing that's out there that we have surprisingly little knowledge about. Uh, and that like knowledge is from things like the really intensive, you know, not understanding of their reproductive biology and sort of sort of basic big B biology, things like that, to just basically what is where. We don't have a very good sense of sort of, we, we have a big picture idea of like, these species occur in the Appalachians, these species occur in Kentucky, but we really don't have a great sense of sort of at finer scales, like where different species occur. And that's a lot of what I do is sort of trying to fill in these gaps to understand where the species grow and uh, why potentially. And then really a lot of that has to do with conservation because lichens are critically threatened by so many forces. Uh, you know, the, their distributions in nature are now largely shaped by sort of our past, present and future actions. <laughs> so a lot of my work involves creating this baseline of data and then go also going back and looking for things that you know were found in places before uh, to see if they're still there. But all of that's with the goal of, of really trying to understand how to manage and conserve them to make sure that these beautiful, wonderful things that I love and I think most people love <laughs> continue to exist on this planet into the future. <laughs> and I mean, lichens, I'll admit, I don't know a whole lot about them, but they are something that I've always kind of, whenever I find them, it's like, oh, and I got to go look at them. And just enjoy them from that respect. But they're not something that we really study a lot or learn a lot about. Right. Like every, to me, I think everyone loves them or, or so many people fall in love with them because there are these really, we have as humans, this really strange innate connection with fungi uh, that's kind of very different from plants and animals because, you know, with plants, you can see them flower and fruit every year so you can understand their biology pretty easily. I think you can imagine like early humans were like, oh, well, yeah, okay, apples, I get how that happens. Yeah. Uh, and you have the same thing with animals. You can see animals have sex, you can have them see them have children, you know, generations happen and you can kind of conceptualize that really. <laughs> you know, but for lichens, it's just, and fungi in general, there's just sort of 
how do they do it? You know, mushroom like pops up out of the ground from nowhere and then it like deliquesces and disappears. These lichens like hang down from trees and grow on rocks and you know, they're like really crunchy when they're dry but then they suck up all this moisture when they're wet and they're sponge-like. You tend to really see them when it's like a little moist and humid and foggy out. And I that adds to the mystique. So just there's something that like, they they sort of have this aura of of mystery and and sort of magic about them uh, that I think is why so many people are just sort of like what's going on there and then you look at them a little closer and it's just like mind bogglingly beautiful and complex. So how did you get interested in lichens and decide to pursue this as a career? So I basically when I was a student in middle school in uh, Philadelphia, I went to public school in Philadelphia, you know, we were encouraged to do do sort of community service work uh, as part of our school. So, you know, every year we had to do X number of hours for community service. And I started volunteering at the Natural History Museum in Philadelphia, the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia. That's the museum, if you're not familiar with it, where they have the Lewis and Clark specimens. Uh, So all of Lewis and Clark's plants that they collected, or the Lewis and Clark expedition collected, those are all there, which is really cool. Thomas Jefferson's fossils are there, including from Kentucky and Big Bone Lick. And so, you know, it's this really old natural history museum with like these fabulous collections of objects. And I was just afforded this amazing opportunity to just like, you know, the scientists are like, yeah, come on in. We have, you know, here are some things you can do. And I I started working with fossil invertebrates. So like, you know, fossil shells and things like that. And uh, I just sort of went from like one department to another department to another department. I ended up in botany and the uh, curator at botany, who was much like myself now, um, although a little older, (laughs) um, you know, he was just like, oh, yeah, well, well, you know, just you can go like go look in the collections up there and you'll you'll figure out the project. And I just started, you know, I organized the collections of fossil plants because I was really interested in fossils at the time. And then when I did that, I was like, oh, well okay, what else is there? And I started looking in the collection, the herbarium, the collection of plants there, plant specimens, and finding all these really cool historical things. Then I was like, oh, but what about, you know, mosses and fungi and all that? Like, that's the part of the collection that, like, I had never really spent any time with, and I saw, like, my time volunteering there that no one was really using those. Too much. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of activity in there. And uh, so I had, there was a, another student there at the time, uh, David Hewitt, uh, and who was a mycologist. He was, he actually ended up going to graduate school at Harvard to study fungi. And he um, and I were like looking through the, again, it's just amazing that we had the opportunity to do this. I mean, who would just let yes. high school kids or, you know, middle school kids go and do this, right? David was there at the time, but um, you know, we, we just, we were like, oh, let's go look at the, the lichens, never done that before. And we like opened up some packets and uh, because the specimens of lichens are in the um, which I could show you if you want. They're little packets like this. Oh, cool. Um, little envelope type things. Yep, little envelopes. So you like hear a little crinkle and a crunch when you, you know, kind of open them. It's like unfolding old paper. <laughs> and uh, we, so I opened one packet and I was like, oh, that's a really cool, you know, specimen of this species. It's a really weird looking thing. I've never seen anything that looks like this before. Um, and I, you know, realized, I recognized that it was this old specimen that was collected by the father of mycology, sort of American father of mycology, um, Louis David von Schweinitz uh, on the Haw River in North Carolina near Winston-Salem and uh, in like 1840. And then, you know, we were like going through the box, 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 box. We open up another packet and it's the same thing, but it has a different name on it and was collected at a different time. And I was like, huh, that's weird. Hmm. The, like, like, I mean, you know, I know nothing about lichens, but these things are so distinctive that, like, they're obviously the same, right. you know, um, and I was like, but they have two different names, and then I did a little bit more research, and I, you know, worked with some other folks there, and went to the library, and all that stuff, and I was like, oh, they're actually the same species, and they had just, it had gotten named multiple times, and so I wrote this lichenologist in, in Europe, and, uh, you know, you can imagine this, like, Inner city Philadelphia like writes random email in like 2000 <laughs> to, mm-hmm. <laughs> to a lichenologist in Europe, and uh, and he wrote me back and he was like, yeah, yeah, that's definitely the case. You should publish that. And I like wrote a paper and it was accepted. And I was, I was if I can know nothing about these organisms and find this, and then just like randomly write to a person and they're like, wow, yeah, you found this thing and you should definitely go do that you know <laughs> do something with that um I'm, they had no idea who I was but you know and that so I and then I can like somehow publish a paper like at, 
as a student in school. Like that's just crazy. So yeah, I, like that clearly wide open field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, that was the, everything just kind of snowballed from there, more or less, you know, the more, the more packets I opened, the more like I would go out and explore the lichens and sort of the local parks around me. Um, I lived in Philadelphia, so there was not a huge diversity of, of <laughs> lichens abundant everywhere, but they were around. Um, and I would go look at them and I try and identify them and just like over the years, you know, it just sort of turned into what it is today, which I guess is now I'm in charge of the largest collection of lichens in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> Rags to Leach's story. <laughs> yes, and that's such a wonderful story, too, because it shows just how much a opportunity, I mean, even for a young child, can make a difference in everything. Well, and the importance of natural history collections. Like, you know, these scientists were like, oh, yeah, totally open-minded. I mean, they were, I mean, open-minded you know, but like, they were like, yeah, come in, do this thing. Oh, we, please, we like share in this knowledge process because we have way too much going on. We have so much to do. There's so many questions. Just like, do this thing, be as self-directed as you want. I'm a very independent person, but like, you know, they were basically like, let's just make sure that you don't screw everything up. <laughs> yes. Other than that, you're good. So, you know, I, and that's, I mean, that, that sort of has ultimately guided my whole career path was that I wanted to give, I like to be able to give people the same opportunities that I had. Um, really, you know, for lack of a better word, I'm, I'm the evangelist for like, <laughs> um, yeah, I've been called before, so that's fine. I'm happy to be a like an evangelist. Hey, yeah, there's a lot worse things you could be, and that sounds like fun. That's true. Yes. <laughs> and museum collections too. I mean, you know, it's like, I have lived in natural history collections for like over 20 years and they are truly amazing things that most people don't even know exist, which is insane. Yes. <laughs> and it's always fun to find somebody like you that's passionate and interested and willing to share that with us because that's we can't even know to go look for them if we don't know they exist. But so many, so many of us that work in museums and natural history collections and, you know, and are the stewards of this like amazing body of historical knowledge that comes with all sorts of fascinating stories, you know, it just, there's so much to it. You know, so many of us are, are sort of, we, we just want people to come like, yes, what can we, how can we bring you here to learn more about this thing, you know? <laughs> yes. And, and invariably, like when I, you know, I work at a botanical garden that we have thousands, hundreds of thousands of visitors, you know, every year, and they come to see the flowers outside, they come to see these art exhibitions, they come to see these things, and most of them probably don't have a really good idea that they're actually also, you know, there's like one of the largest collections of, of natural history specimens of plants and fungi in the world right here, but then when you, like when we have these opportunities, we do these open houses sometimes, whenever we have an opportunity to just sort of bring people in, everyone is like blown away, and they invariably, everyone says, this was the best part of my trip, you know, they have no idea, and then you, you show them these things, and they get to like see it, and they have questions, and they're like, everybody gets so worked up over it, um, so yeah, so they're just, you know, it's one of those things, like I pull people, I, if I'm walking down the hall and I see someone and I'm like, hey, do you want to go see the collection here? Because, you know, you're here to look at this other thing, but why not? And invariably say yes, and then they are never disappointed. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All the good stuff's hidden back when in the research labs. Well, but these aren't, this isn't even a lab. I mean, it's like an archive, you know, oh. the best stuff is in the archives. Yes. <laughs> good point. Yes. <laughs> It's the, the best stuff is the stuff that no one is looking at or that is sort of, uh, yeah, it's just sort of, it's, it's not forgotten is not the right word, but the, the, the things that are just not actively being looked at are, are just where the true treasures and sort of hidden things are. It's just, you, you never know what you'll find. You could open, a, could open a folder and you could find a specimen of Lewis and Clark's that's never been seen since it was, you know, processed like 200 years ago. You could find a specimen from Charles Darwin mm -hmm. from the Voyage of the Beagle. It has happened. Wow. <laughs> yes. And that's, I mean, if you're into science and nature, I mean, it's that mystery, it's that excitement, it's that unknown, that's part of the appeal to it. Totally. Well, and that's why, like, you know, we were speaking earlier before you started recording about John Day's collections from Mammoth uh, Cave National Park and from the Southern Appalachians that he donated here. And, you know, we, we receive a lot of specimens that, you know, have been amassed by people over the years, and then they 
I have this collection. I'm like, what do we do with this? And they donate it to a museum. And I love receiving that material <laughs> and processing it, even though it's a huge amount of work and it, you know, it's a huge task. But um, at the same time, you never know what you're going to, you open a packet and it could be anything. Mm-hmm. And it's like every thousand are just uh, the normal things that you expect to see. But then Every once in a while, you open an envelope up and you find something that's just like, I had no idea this was there, that it was, you know, I would never have expected it. Or it's like, you know, it, it's a document, some rare species occurrence that we had no idea it was ever there. And then you can go back and look for it and find it and it's still there. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, connect past and present and people and all that. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm really good at getting sidetracked. Oh, no. Yeah, I love it. Um, so... When we were emailing back and forth, I kind of half joked that my lack of knowledge can be summed up somewhere along the lines of fungus plus algae, can be air quality indicators, um, breaks down rocks or eats rocks, and reindeer eat them. Uh, And yeah, I was half joking, and it's a bit of an oversimplification. I do know a little bit more about lichens than that. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not a whole lot more. And I think most people are kind of in that same boat. We know a few general snippets of information, those fun facts, but not a whole lot more. Let's be clear. Those are good facts to know. Yes, they are. But it's those oddball pieces. It's not like a really in-depth knowledge. And the more I'm talking to you, the more excited I am to learn more about lichens and to know more about them. Um, And really like, no, not just these little random pieces of information scattered around. Well, you know, the other crazy thing is when I first started 20 years, I mean, so like I, I my other colleagues that are sort of in the same age bracket, <laughs> same sort of like when we got started bracket, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, you know, when we started, there was almost, well, not that there was nothing, but there was very little recent that had been published. And it was almost impossible to find out information about these things, right? Like there was like, you know, an old textbook from the 80s. There was what well, I guess the 80s was a lot closer to that time than present day. We can both be horrified about that later. But if you, for instance, if you wanted to identify a lichen, you had keys from 1930. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. It had never been updated. Um, and that was it. You, you know, at that, at that time, the Lichens of North America, if you've seen that book, Lichens of North America, was uh, lead authored by Ernie Brodo, who's at the Canadian Museum of Nature. He uh, was actually born in the Bronx. He's a Bronx native, New York City native. He and uh, this couple of photographers basically put together this beautiful coffee table book about lichens. It's, it's published by Yale Press. It's, I think it's still in print. Um, but it, it was like the thing that came out in 2001 that was just like, oh my goodness, finally, information about these things that's understandable, recent, beautifully illustrated. And like, I got inspired by that. I mean, I was already totally, you know, into lichens at that point, but what that was like, oh, wow, I actually can finally really learn something because there's something that's accessible and beautiful and engaging. Uh, And I know a lot of other people who felt the same way. But the funny thing is that, you know, fast forward 20 years, and now, you know, a lot of us who sort of came of age around that time, I guess, and we're, we're really frustrated by the lack of resources to identify things and like, you know, figure out where things were and all of that kind of stuff. We've now started to write those resources so that, you know, like a student starting now has access to all of this body of knowledge that's like, was essentially non-existent or inaccessible 20 years ago. It's crazy Mm -hmm. and wonderful. Yes, and it is. And that's one of the things I want to make sure we talk about is your book, because it does help to do that. And I know I remember, I mean, when we never talked about lichens, they're not big and flashy in the same way that birds and mammals and flowers are. And then anytime when I kind of tried to learn what a lichen was, because it caught my attention, there was nothing really that was accessible the books all smelled um that they had <laughs> musty old book smell and not, not a good, good way <laughs> not a good musty old book smell <laughs> and, and they were um written in dichotomous keys which okay i'm a wildlife biologist i can follow a dichotomous key i had no clue on the jargon though and the t- oh. um, terms yep. for lichens so i was just like okay pretty and that's as far as i would go well most things at that time did not have photos so mm-hmm. I mean, I personally am a visual thinker, so I yes. like I I can read words and they are meaningless to me. If I see a picture, I got it. Mm-hmm. And it was for that was the most frustrating thing to me about 
trying to identify lichens and learn about them was that everything was like, as you said, just words on a page, dichotomous keys, like incredibly jargony, but also just like not engaging. No, they put you to sleep really right. fast. <laughs> lichens are amazing you know like here are these things that you're just like these are these are insane they are doing like they are beautiful they're like they're clearly fascinating and then you go to open a book and you're like this smells like mold and is boring yes so. <laughs> we're we're aiming to change that these days lichens are like really hot now i think like fungi in general they are they are finally getting the moment that they have long deserved yes now i mean i guess we should kind of start with some beginning parts sure. so Tell us about what is a lichen. Let, let's start at the beginning in case people are don't really know a whole lot about it. Lichens are a lifestyle, um, and that's sort of our trademark way of talking about them because they are fungi. So lichens are fungi. They are fungi that have evolved a really amazing and really unique lifestyle that involves entering into these symbioses, so these really tight-knit, close relationships with algae and cyanobacteria for the purposes of obtaining nutrition. So, you know, fungi have to get their energy and their nutrients and everything from somewhere. And these different fungi have evolved this kind of lifestyle. You have fungi that are parasites on things. You have fungi that like decompose wood. Fungi have evolved all of these different lifestyles and lichens are just one of the lifestyles. But it's a lifestyle that's arisen many different times. And it's even been lost a number of times as well. So, you know, like that's the thing, lichens like right out of the box kind of blow, blow your mind because they really require you to think in non-linear and non-traditional ways because they are not one group of organisms. So like fungi are crazy diverse. They cover all sorts of things, right? Like fungi are millions and millions of species that are doing all sorts of different things in the environment. And they are real, they, you know, they share a common ancestor, but like from there, they've really exploded and become quite diverse and different. And lichens are sort of very similar to that. So when you think about like sunflowers, all sunflowers are in one family. Right. You know, the sunflower family, the Asteraceae. It's a big family, the flowers are pretty, but you know what? It's all one thing more or less, right? One evolution lineage. Lichens are not that. Lichens are like talking about herbaceous plants or talking about tree. You're talking like, a growth form of a thing. You're talking about sort of a habit, the way the way it has come to be, um, you know, the way it lives. I guess is a way of thinking of it. Um, and so it's this lifestyle that's arisen lots of different times in the fungi because it's clearly advantageous. You get your food from a thing that lives basically inside of you. So like these fungi that enter into symbioses, and the symbioses uh, are with algae and cyanobacteria. So those provide the the sort of sugars and things like that that the fungus needs uh, as nutrition and the in turn in return if you want to anthropomorphize it I'm kind of I always hesitant to do, do that because lichens are not people right. uh, and they're probably their relationships with uh, the other things around them and in them are probably just as complex as people's relationships <laughs> with the things in and around them <laughs> mm -hmm. but the so the lichen fungus provides the bulk of the sort of body of the thing. We call the body the thallus. It's the majority of what you see, the vegetative stuff. Most of what you see in a lichen is the thallus. Most of it's formed by the fungus. And then within that framework, there's a layer of algae or cyanobacteria, whatever it may be, um, sort of intermixed with the fungal cells. And that's where that all is. And then interlaced through all of that and on the outside of the lichen, the inside, all the spaces, there's all these bacteria. There's also like invertebrates that only live inside the lichen. Some of those kinds of things have to be there, we think. So there's like some of them actually have functional roles in the lichen. So, you know, the, the main thing is the fungus plus the alga or whatever it might be. But then there's other bacteria that it needs to survive as well. Just like people, we have bacteria inside of us that we need to do things. <laughs> Time, we also have bacteria inside of us that don't necessarily have to be there. And maybe the composition of our microbiome, of our gut fauna <laughs> and flora, you know, changes over time. Same thing with the lichens. So, you know, they're, they're just like every other living thing on earth in that, you know, they're primarily a fungus 
So primarily one thing happens to be a fungus. They've got this main other thing that is providing them with their food. And then they've got all this other stuff in them and around them and on them. That's like some of which is important, some of which may not be, some of which might be trying to like attack them, uh, you know, <laughs> they're ecosystems. Um, but they're ecosystems that revolve around a fungus. Very interesting. Sorry, that was a complicated way of saying they're fungi that are amazing. No, no, that, that's really interesting. And until recently, I never realized that there were all these other things in there. And one of the things that I had a question about with that is, so it's not like a certain group of things lives in each species of lichen. It's more like the ecosystems we're more familiar with, like a prairie or woods, where you have a suite of things that could be, but each individual one's a little bit unique. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way of thinking of it. Or it's kind of like people, two people in two different parts of the city, you know, two people in different countries, two people, one person in a mountain, one person living in the desert, they might have different microbiomes. So they might have different bacteria and different fungi and different stuff in and on them, just because of where they have been in the past, where they are now, what they eat, all of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, like they're still humans, they're just a little bit different inside and outside a little bit too. Um, and so lichens are the same way. Basically the lichens, even though they're these really complex, amazing things that are like composed of all of these different plant-like things, animal-like things, you know, even though they're composed of all of this stuff, ultimately, when you talk about a lichen, you're talking about the fungus that is doing that. And so when you talk about a, a lichen species and you talk about, you know, I say a Latin name and I'm saying that's this species, what I'm talking about is that fungus, because everywhere that fungus grows, when it grows and forms a lichen, which it has to do. Most of these lichen fungi have to form a lichen to survive. There's always some exceptions, but um, you know, the vast majority of lichen fungi have to form lichens to survive. So everywhere that that one species grows, it looks the same. Again, there's like one or two exceptions, but everywhere it grows, it more or less looks the same. And it associates usually with more or less the same kind of alga or the same kind of, of cyanobacteria. It might vary a little bit, but that's because maybe, you know, the algae needs to be a little better adapted to one spot than another to like really do well. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the bacteria and the other stuff that's living inside and around them. That can vary from place to place. And in fact, we actually know that it does vary from place to place, but it tends to be really specific to a uh, to a small area and then all lichens in that small area regardless of what species they are might share the different members of the of that you know community so to speak so they're like the same bacteria and fungi that are not the lichens the like other fungi all that stuff is potentially being shared by different species of lichens uh, in the same small general area very interesting and i didn't even i always assumed that it's the same fungus and the same algae but you're saying it's just the same fungus and the algae can change. So it's variable. So some species have really tight knit one-to-one, -one, like one fungus, one alga all the time. You get them together, you get that lichen. That's anytime you find the lichen, it must be those two things. But most of them are not that way. Most of them are like one fungus and then it associates with like that alga most of the time, but maybe they're not all, maybe, you know, it's could sometimes deal with different species that are in the same genus, so different species of algae that are closely related or associate with different um, sort of genetically distinct strains of the same alga, again, that are presumably adapted to where they grow. So how does the algae and the other things, the microbes and stuff, get into the lichen? How does that community develop? And when does it develop? So like, that's a complex question. <laughs> Simplest questions, right? And this is, again, this is the kind of thing that's amazing because we did not know this really until, or we had ideas, but like, it's really only relatively recently that, that a lot of this is starting to sort of come into clearer focus, mainly thanks to next generation DNA sequencing technologies. Because now we can actually grind up a lichen, sequence its DNA and find out all the stuff that's inside it and how variable or uniform that stuff is. And so how does that community form? We don't fully know, right? Because like you can imagine just like with people and anything else, the community might change over time, right? Right. Depending on sort of what microbes are in the environment and what the lichen comes in contact with. If it's compatible, it might take it in. If it's not compatible, it keeps it out maybe. 
but actually it seems like a lot of those communities are actually sort of, they're given from one lichen generation to the next, so to speak. So they're transmitted uh, through vegetative reproduction. So lichens actually have some of the most complex reproductive processes in nature. They're crazy. So fungi have really crazy reproductive biology. They can do all sorts of things. You know, a good way to think about that is like the potato blight. Um, so, you know, you have these fungi that can have a sexual state that lives on one plant and then an asexual state that lives on a completely unrelated plant. And then it's kind of switches back and forth and back and forth. Um, and so like you can eradicate the one plant that the one stage lives on, but then if you don't do it to the other one, then reinfect it the next time the plant grows. So like fungi have these really complex asexual and sexual reproductive processes and lichens have those too, because they're fungi. So they're just like fungi all the other ones, except also they've developed sort of all of these really unique structures that basically propagate the lichen. So they break apart the lichen and they disperse all of the parts of the lichen together. It's so like all the, all the members of the community get dispersed together into the environment and those establish. So like they're clones, presumably, and it's like a little packet of lichen that breaks off of the parent falls somewhere nearby most of the time. Sometimes it moves a really far distance, but most of the time it doesn't. And then that little packet lands, establishes, and starts to grow, and it forms a new lichen that's presumably identical to the parent. And so that's how you get these communities where they're like a tree covered in one species, lots of individuals. Most of the individuals, they probably arise that way through this like vegetative process. Okay. So their communities are all probably really similar. But then how do they switch it up? Well, they probably switch it up most of the time when they use the regular fungal reproductive cycles. And so they disperse a spore, they have sex, and they shoot a spore out into the environment. It's just a fungus spore. It has to find its partners again. Same thing if it uses the asexual fungal means. It just you know breaks off a little piece of only the fungus, and then that fungus has to germinate and find the partners again. And so it's having all those options available that like lets them sort of keep experimenting to find better matches while at the same time, like keeping the same thing going over and over and over again. Yes. And, and I'm th- with all these complex communities, it's a lot. you would have to keep going with the guaranteed thing because most of the time I would think it just doesn't work with the sexual reproduction. If you have to go find your own community again, because the odds of landing somewhere where everybody else is, going to be pretty low, I would think. Us never find our one true love. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, but it's quite fascinating because it really does imply that they are swamping the environment with these like, you know, clonal things that establish huge numbers of individuals that provide the available bacteria and algae for then a spore to land and germinate and maybe get the algae it needs to partner with to survive. So they kind of like lichens beget lichens. <laughs> um, it's just, it's a really fascinating way to survive and to think about how they're doing that. And then also the added end of this, which is what kind of becomes the like mind exploding part is that within what you perceive as a single lichen, there's potentially multiple different genetic individuals of the fungus. Oh wow. And then there's also potentially multiple different algae genetic strains. And you know, on one hand you're like that's insane. How does that work? <laughs> I see a lichen that looks like a, you know, a normal rosette lichen. I see its edge, it's one thing. How could it have all this stuff in there? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but at the same time, then you think to yourself, well, if most of the time sexual reproduction fails probably, and they're really trying to survive and they're like, and they have, they have mating types. So like they have to find their mate, um, which again is like, how does that work? Imagine you know, this little tiny thing has to find this little tiny thing. <laughs> and so one way to get around all of that is to have your one individual just be composed of a bunch of different genetically different strains of your fungus that might be compatible and living together. So like a community of individuals rather than one individual. And the same thing with the algae, you would make sense to have kind of different variants of the algae that you're able to survive with or that you need inside of your body. Because like if 
climate starts to warm or if there's some kind of change that starts to happen, maybe you propagate more of one alga that's like better adapted to that than the others. And then like, if you know, if it gets a little too cold, then maybe you start to propagate the one that's like better at dealing with that. And that's like making this all sound like they're doing this in a, you know, highly thought out intelligent way. But I mean, it also makes sense, sort of like that's how a system would evolve to perpetuate itself and survive and adapt. And lichens are really good at that. On well, long term, long scales. Long scales, yes. Yeah, they suck short term adaptation, but they're real good at long term adaptation. Because all evidence of experimental studies has shown that basically when you change what their environment a little bit, they die. What's concerning for them now is just large scale habitat loss, habitat destruction fragmentation, urbanization, pollution, all of those kinds of things that can just wipe them out in one fell swoop or wipe out a whole species or huge populations of them. That's what's really imminently pressing. And they've been impacted in that way for centuries. So where are some of the places that we can find lichens? I mean, everywhere. Good answer. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, seriously, everywhere. It's almost impossible to go to a place and not find something. Mm -hmm. Midtown Manhattan, there are some like, not a lot, (laughs) you know, not abundant, but you can find them. So you can find them anywhere. You just have to look. That's great. So how many lichens are there in the Eastern U.S.? How many species? In the Eastern U.S., it's probably about 2,500 to 3,000. So there is about 25,000 described species in the world. That's an undercount. We know there are almost certainly many more than that. And so there's about 25,000 named right now. There's about 5,400 or so known from the United States and Canada. And by far, you know, probably more than half of those are in Eastern North America. Okay. So there's a lot. And we find new ones all the time. I mean, in the time that, you know, I've been working that list of like 5,400 has grown dramatically. And literally every month there are more reports. I can go out into the forest and like in every trip find something that has not been found almost with certainty on the continent before. It's not that hard to do. Lichens are just one of those groups that I would think that there's still a lot more to be discovered. I mean, yes, like you were saying at the beginning, I mean, we don't know a lot about the biology to begin with. I mean, there's just so much that we don't know that would be considered these basic point. So how in the world do we even think we know close to all the species? Of course we don't. I mean, I would assume lichens in many ways are one of those groups that you often have to grind them up and look at the DNA to tell whether you got species A or species B. No, you can actually identify almost all of them. Really? If you know them well. So like when you become intimately familiar with them, as I (laughs) um, you can be reasonably certain about what most things will be in the field with a hand lens Um, requires a lot of like that's like really intense (laughs) level level. and that's like including all these little tiny crustose lichens some of which look very similar it's only a relatively small number of them that you can't actually tell apart in the field but but most of them especially the bigger ones you can tell pretty easily all right once you know how to tell them apart and you some sort of like basic vocabulary words and you, you know, sit down and you really learn what those words mean and how to like apply them visually to things. It's really feasible to do. And the reason why this is, which again is, is really fascinating, is that in any one place, you don't get very many species that are closely related to each other. So yes, indeed, there are species that are almost indistinguishable and you need DNA to tell them apart. But most of the time those do not co-occur together. So if they grow at the same place, one will probably be like on rock versus bark. You know, so 90% of the time you're right. And it's like 1% of the time you're gonna be wrong without the DNA. Uh, And the same thing is true where they often don't have overlapping distributions. So, you know, one species might grow in the Western US, one species might grow in the Eastern US. And for the most part, they don't have overlapping distributions. So they might look identical or very close to identical, but you would never really confuse them most of the time because most of the time you see them, they're in different places and they, uh, they look different from everything else around them. Mm-hmm. So like they have these ways of looking <laughs> and in any one given place, there's usually only like one that looks that way. <laughs> nice. That is helpful. Very convenient. Yes. 
because I know like the names of two different types of like, and then I only know the common names for them. And one's the British soldiers, the little gray ones with the little red. Bodonia on. Christmas. Yep. Okay. And the other is reindeer moss, which mm -hmm. isn't even a moss. It's a lichen, which I'm curious, is reindeer moss, and maybe it's the same with the British soldiers, are they really species or are they like saying goldenrod or oak? Well, it's sort of like they are species. So there are species that are those things. And so British soldiers, the, the, the species that applies to is Clodonia cristatella. It was named by the father of American lichenology, uh, Edward Tuckerman, you know, because the caps look like the caps of British soldiers <laughs> from the Revolutionary <laughs> Times, uh, redcoats and uh, reindeer moss, reindeer lichen is Clodonia ranger farina. Um, and so we know there, we know the species that are those things, but when people speak of British soldiers, usually they're referring to any one of the many Cladonia species that have those red caps on them. And the same thing with the reindeer lichens. You know, there's reindeer lichen is like a broad group of many different species that have this very similar sort of like tufted, cushiony growth form. So if you have a field guide that tells you the different kinds, then you can tease them apart really easily. And, you know, it's more just like a general way of referring to them because we're just trying to get people to pay attention to them, let alone like work carefully. So, you know, uh, we'll take British soldiers for both Clodonia cristatella and anything that's red. So the reindeer lichens that I've got here in Kentucky, mm -hmm. are they the reindeer lichen or are they just in that group? The true reindeer lichen, Clodonia ranger farina, grows in a whole lot of areas throughout the Northern Hemisphere um, and in parts of the Southern Hemisphere as well. And it, it's all throughout Appalachia. It's really only when you get down into sort of central Alabama and Georgia where you pick up a different species that looks the same. But when you're talking about reindeer moss or reindeer lichen, there's two main things that you would see really in anywhere in the Eastern US. One is sort of a yellowish color, yellowish green color when it's dry. And one of them is like bone white or gray when it's dry. Yeah, that's the one I usually see. That's the true reindeer like in Clodonia ranger farina. The other one is depending on where you are, Clodonia arbuscula, Clodonia subtenuous. There's two different species that are yellowish. Okay. Yeah, I've never seen that one or at least never realized I was seeing it. It's finer looking. I mean, yeah, it just, it really depends where you are. If you're like on a roadside in a, like a, an old dirt road somewhere in a low elevation in Appalachia, you'll, your sandy areas, especially, you're really likely to see that. Rock outcrops, like a big granite dome or a sandstone glade or something like that, you're likely to see that. But where you are, there's a lot of limestone. Uh, and the reindeer lichens don't love limestone. Got to go to Big South Fork or somewhere where there's, you know, bigger bigger sandstone and granite outcrops. Clodonia has reached their peak in acid habitats. And I mean, there is a decent amount of sandstone even around where I'm at, depending yeah. on whether you're up on the ridge top or down, lower yeah. down is sandstone versus limestone. So yeah, yeah, all that geology really matters. I never realized it in college, but yeah, the more I get out in the world and start doing things, it's like, yeah, that geology matters a lot. <laughs> oh. I, well, geology is like the lichens go by geology. So you can, you don't have to know geology if you know the lichens, <laughs> because you can tell if the rocks are calcareous or not. You, you can't know like it's this, you know, Anakista shale, or, you know, you can't know it's like really fine level detail information about what kind of rock it is, but you can tell if a lot about the rocks based on the lichens that are there. And especially even individual species, you can get pretty close to a really good idea of what kinds of rocks they are. Same thing is true of the of trees and things like that as well. You can tell a lot about them. You can read the forest, so to speak. You can read the environment based on the lichens. You can tell what's happened at a place in the past. Uh, like, you know, if it's a forest, has it been cut? Has it been altered in some way? How many, how much has that happened? How recently, you know, was there a forest fire? How intense was the forest fire? And you, you can just tell so much about the landscape through the lichens. It's, they're like a lens through which you can just sort of view the whole world. It's crazy. Okay, I definitely have to learn more about lichens now yeah. because I already do that with the woods and the plants and the field. I do exactly what you do and read and tell what the story is behind it. And I love doing that. And if the lichens can tell me more, Oh, I've got to learn the lichens now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like another layer. It's it's like a yes. it, it's sort of like another layer on top of what you would normally see, but they re really reveal a lot of subtle things that would not necessarily be entirely clear from the plants. Um, just because plants are not as sensitive to disturbance and past history and pollution and things like that as the lichens are, and because the lichens are like so diverse and belong to so many different groups of fungi, some of them are like 
really intolerant of this kind of thing. Some of them like, you know, can't withstand, or some of them can't do this. Some of them can't deal with that. Some of them can't deal with a clear cut. Some of them, you know, can't deal with fire. And so the community of what you see, the different species that you see at a site, how abundant they are, how not abundant they are, can tell you a lot about all of that stuff. That's just sort of, you would, two forests that would otherwise look very similar can differ completely in their lichens because of sort of all of these past processes that have played out. Oh, cool. So how does somebody like me who doesn't have this big, long background and lichens get started learning more. Pick up a field guide. I mean, I think that for like the introduction about like what lichens are, how they're used by people, sort of some basic things about how to identify them, um, that kind of stuff. You know, there's actually a number of good resources out there for that. Um, I really, I mean, lichens of North America, it's an oldie, but a goodie, 2001. I mean, old 2001, horrifying, but- um, Yes, that is horrifying. <laughs> It's a beautiful book and the introductory chapters are really useful and cover sort of like all the things that like you want to be able to say about lichens to your friends. And then, you know, beyond that, you have to learn the individual individual stories of the different species. And the way to do that is really in a field guide, uh, you know, the, like urban lichens uh, that Jesse and I wrote or the field guide to the Great Smoky Mountains, which a colleague Aaron Tripp and I wrote. Um, there's just, you know, there are these kinds of guides now that are available. Not a lot. Uh, there are more coming are intended to be ex pretty accessible, minimally jargon heavy, and really sort of, they, you, they, they'll say, oh, this species is almost always found on oak, you know, or almost always found on red oaks, and it tends to be in, you know, mature hardwood forests or mature, more higher quality forests or things like that. And it's by learning that kind of thing that you can really start to, you're like, oh, every time I see that lichen, it is always on large old oak trees. You mentioned a couple of field guides there, and I know your book is kind of focused on urban areas and mm -hmm. northeastern North America. And you mentioned mm -hmm. one for the Smokies, but given all this variety of lichens, how geographically specific are they? So northeastern North America, what does that entail? Like, where's the southern, where's the western limits? And where's the south and where's the north? It's not the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> Lichens don't obey political bounds. No, uh, exactly. Which is why I always ask that question when people say Northeast, Southwest, because I mean, I do it the same thing too, but that varies based on what organism you're talking about. So with lichens, if you go about 500 miles in any direction, you usually vastly change the lichens. But that makes sense because if you go 500 miles in any direction, you normally are in a very different place. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, basically like in the Eastern US, which is, that's my specialty is the Eastern US and Eastern Canada, but the common widespread things are pretty common and widespread throughout the temperate East. So they kind of break into these broad groups of like things that are Northern and boreal. So you get them in like, you know, Maine and New Hampshire. And then they, then as they go further South, they're higher up in the mountains in habitats that are like ecosystems where you would think you feel like you're in Maine or New Hampshire, Northern Hardwood, Spruce Fir. And then if you go down the mountain, you're in sort of more of like, you know, more temperate deciduous forests that would remind you of like Kentucky or Pennsylvania or Ohio or Virginia and Maryland. And those, are, those species are, are sort of like, they're pretty shared throughout the temperate East. And then if you go further down a mountain into like a lower elevation um, stream, ravine or something like that, where it's really humid and kind of feels a little tropically, you start to get species that are more typical, the sort of subtropics. They're like places like the coastal plain and the, the coast of North Carolina or South Carolina. And it's just as you go further north, you just get more northern species. As you go further south, you get fewer northern species and more southern things. And if you go to southern Florida, you start picking up all of these tropical species that are like strictly tropical that just make it into the U.S. there. They follow this. It's the same situation as with like broad groups of plants. So, you know, if you think of like the flora of an area, like your forest that's mostly composed of this kind of tree or these kinds of trees, the lichens are going to be pretty similar throughout all of forests of that, that general type, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I want to make sure we talk about your book some more. Um, <laughs> tell us about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So when we talk about lichens, we always talk about them in natural areas, right? You think about like going into this hike into the wilderness or like, you know, something like that. And you say, That's where the lichens will be. They'll be in this like intact natural area where you have to travel from your home to another place to see them. And that's how I, most of my research, my whole career has been spent leaving New York City to go to another place to study lichens. 
the diversity and abundance here was just so much less and, and really, you know, like everything was altered here. But the reality is that post the Clean Air Act, so, you know, after the Clean Air Act went in, into place, the air quality improved. And now lichens have started to recolonize cities throughout the United States and Canada when we know they weren't here in the 70s, 60s, 50s. Uh, or if they were, they were in very low abundance and very few species, but there's been this sort of like resurgence of them. And now they've become so sort of conspicuous that like people notice them. Uh, and they're a pretty visible part of the like urban biota around you. And uh, so it's kind of amazing that there were no resources to identify the lichens in cities. And it's really surprising but it makes a lot of sense because nobody was studying them really. Like we know that lichens are impacted by air quality and there's been lots of studies of how they're impacted in cities and things like that. But there was just like no real resources for people that wanted to identify them in cities. And so you would use a field guide for like the North Woods in Manhattan. And that is problematic for many reasons. Most of which are most of the species do not occur here. So it's a very different subset of species that are adapted to be in cities uh, or adapted to a lot of the you know, environmental conditions of cities. And then when it is the same species that grows in a much more, much less disturbed or sort of different habitat, like you would in Northwoods, let's say, uh, or something that fell outside of a city, it tends to look different in the city. Because in lichens, cities induce what we call a city morph. Um, because, you know, cities tend to be drier, hotter, it's just like sort of harsher conditions, maybe there's more nitrogen, there's like lots of things about the city that are different than the surrounding area. Anyone that goes to a city knows that. Knows that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the definition of a city. And so the lichens sort of have this different look because of that. And, you know, sometimes they're a little runtier, a little scragglier, some of them are just like a little bigger, their colors are a little different. So even if you have a field guide that includes those species, it's not really easy, easy to use in a city because they look so different that you would be like, I don't know, is it really this? I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe you, you like squint with one eye. <laughs> like, I can see that. And so there really were no resources devoted to lichens in the United States and Canada in cities, uh, which was crazy because like that's where most people live. That's where a lot of people recreate. And, you know, we were really surprised by that. And so Jesse, like, Jessie was the leader of all of this because when she was a graduate student here at the New York Botanical Garden at the City University of New York, she taught classes and she was involved with the Macaulay Honors College BioBlitz every year in the city. And it was as part of like doing that that she was like, wow, there's actually all these lichens here. And, um, and then she was like trying to help people identify them for like a BioBlitz, you know? <laughs> and, and they were like, how do we do this? And it was no resource to do that. And we realized that there's this really great baseline of lichen data from New York City from the 1960s and before, because there has been, you know, the botanical garden, and then there's been botanists in New York City for so long. And Ernie Brodo, who wrote Lichens in North America, was a native New Yorker, and his thesis was the lichens of Long Island. So he lived in New York City, and he intensively studied the lichens on Long Island in the 60s. So like, we had a whole lot of information, but like, nobody had really updated it recently. Mm -hmm. And Jesse would go to go give these lectures, you know, about lichens to people and interact with them and take them on like walks in Central Park. And then everyone would say, how do we identify these? Yes. <laughs> how do we learn about this? And it was like, oh, uh, <laughs> so really do something about this. And I mean, that same thing would happen to me. I would be asked to give a lecture about lichens from, you know, to some group of people. And I would give this whole thing about lichens and how amazing they are and how biodiverse and about like my research in Appalachia or something about that. And in the end, like somebody said, well, what about in New York City? And I was like, well, you know, there's like not as many species. They look kind of different. Good luck. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, Jesse was really doing a lot of this work. And she just said, you know, why doesn't somebody just do it? And so... She started writing the book and then she involved me and uh, our, another student here at the Botanical Garden, Jordan Hoffman, who took a lot of photographs of lichens throughout the city. And, you know, she really spearheaded this effort and sort of brought us in to put together the first field guide for the lichen, the place where most people live. <laughs> and I love that too, because I mean, it's something that I don't care what taxa of organisms you're studying. We've all been taught from the time we were itty bitty that you go somewhere else to enjoy yep. nature. And yep. we're just now really starting to look in our own 
communities in our own yards and whether you're in the rural areas or the urban areas. And so, yeah, I love that idea. You know, I am someone who is like unabashedly about research in your own backyard. And you know, whereas many scientists study things that are not near them, I have devoted my career to studying the lichens in Eastern United States mainly, because I feel like that's a region I know well, it's a region I care about. It's a region where like, maybe I can actually have an impact because I know people and you know, I understand, you know, many of the nuances of the communities and, and, you know, things like that here. And it's an area I want to know more about the things that are in the area where I live. But yet, like, even I was leaving my, you know, my home <laughs> to go to another place. It just so happens to have not been quite so distant right. as like the Amazon, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. I'm so pleased and so thankful that Jesse involved me in this because, you know, I always was like, yeah, there's lichens here, uh, whatever. But like, it was through the writing of this book and like looking for the lichens to photograph. And I just started to see them more. Like the first time she and I went out in Central Park and we were just like, let's see what we find here. And we we're like, whoa, I was just like, wait, there's this here and this here. And I, I used to live on the upper side of Manhattan and I used to run in Central Park I was like oh yeah I know there's like some in this one area where I would run every day and um but then we were just walking around and we saw so many there was like one that I was like I can't believe this is in New York City it's like not shouldn't be here and it's like growing abundantly on this tree and we were blown away you know and it's sort of like now everywhere I go it's like a, a in the city and really other places well I'm always like oh huh let's see what's on the trees in this park or you know I, I live in downtown Manhattan and I run on the East River and I, I'm always like checking out the trees to see oh which one you know okay so like which ones have managed to like make it back here or, like one day I turned around where I usually turn around at the Brooklyn Bridge and I was like you know there's like no lichens down by the Brooklyn Bridge it's like there's you know there's just so much foot traffic and there's so many people that you know most surfaces get rubbed off really quickly like lichens can't establish and I like sat down on this bench and the bench it's old wooden bench under the Brooklyn Bridge and it has the armrests on the bench, but it had like several of them throughout the bench rather than just one on the end. The ends. So they kind of spaced out where people could sit. Anyway, these little armrests create an area that's like a shadow under them where people just don't sit. And lo and behold, I looked at it. And I was like, that's a little dark. I wonder why that's darker. And I like, got, I looked a little closer. I was like, I'll be. There's like three species of crustose lichen growing in the little shadow of every single one of the like armrests on that bench. Like it just blew me away. And it's just sort of like opens up this whole dimension in my home. I would never have thought was even there. And if it can do that for me, I imagine it does that very well for other people too. <laughs> yes, exactly. So being that we have city morphs, mm -hmm. somebody that doesn't live in a city that's more rural, more agriculture, probably wouldn't get as much from this book as a different field guide, or would they kind of still blend together? So the really great thing about this book is that it covers the species that you are most likely to see in like your backyard in suburban Eastern North America. It works really well in cities in the Northeast, but really the cohort of species are pretty similar between Boston, New York, Washington, DC, Chicago. Like if you go into a city in the temperate East, you have to get pretty far South before you get like so many different species that you wouldn't be identifiable. But the great thing is that, you know, the cohort of things that are in your backyard are pretty similar. They might look a little bigger and a little showier, but you know, they're going to look pretty similar to the way that they would in this book. So it's really like, the only place where it's not super effective in the temperate Eastern United States is really like in an old growth forest. Like you could take this book into the forest in most areas in Pennsylvania, you know, second growth, third growth forest, you'd be able to identify a lot of the lichens. You'd certainly be able to recognize the genera and the most common species. So, you know, it's not the ideal resource for that but it could be used for it. And it certainly would work in like city parks or suburban parks or just sort of the places where most people recreate most of the time or like most people leisurely sit in their backyard in a chair and, you know, the lichens that are on your trees, you'll mostly be able to identify with this book. And that's helpful too, because I mean, we're most likely probably going to be looking at the lichens in our yards and stuff to get started with, especially mm -hmm. And so this just narrows that focus down and it's not so overwhelming. Well, and that's really important because one of the like biggest things that happens with, with so many people when you start out with lichens is like, 
you get Lakens of North America. You've got like a beautiful book and you're like, all right, I'm ready to go. And then you go to identify a lichen and you're like, oh, how do I do this? Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, how do I figure out which of the like 500 that are in this book? You know, it is. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and also most people start with the ones that are like the British soldiers, unfortunately. Most people start with those because they happen to be like three-dimensional and they're really showy. And so like, those are the ones that everybody's like, oh, I want to figure out what that one is. But it just so happens that group is like the hardest to identify because they're variable. So like the combination of having this like huge resource with everything Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then also like tending to start with some of the hardest things to identify. A lot of people hit a wall and they're just like, all right, lichens are amazing. I'm going to put this book back and not try to identify them again. (laughs) But when you have a smaller, a book that has a much smaller subset of things that includes the most common things and you're not going to get sidetracked with like, you know, in your backyard in whatever rural or in your backyard in suburban Virginia, you're like not going to have to worry about whether or not you have a species that only grows on the Channel Islands of California or only in an old growth forest in Western North Carolina or only in like the Arctic tundra. Even though they may seem very similar in words, they might even look very similar in pictures, but like you don't have to worry about that because the book only has the ones that are going to be more or less in that place. And I like that. I mean, whenever I'm identifying anything, (laughs) I'm looking at the habitat and I'm like, okay, Drop that, drop that, drop that, drop that. I'm not even going to think about those things. It has to be within this group. I, I mean, I before I even look at the bird, flower, tree, whatever, I've already dropped three quarters of the possibilities because they're not possibilities in that location or that habitat. The other nice thing about the book is that I wrote a key for it. So we originally, we had it as like information about like and sort of basic biology, like how are they used? Where are you likely to see them in New York? There's like a tour of if, uh, if you wanted to try and find as many lichens as you could in a day in New York City, on this, like with one in subway. Right? You know? <laughs> uh, it's really fun. And then we had like treatments of all the different species with photographs and sort of descriptions and discussions and stuff like that, where to find them. And um, so we thought that was really helpful. But then I was like, you know, why don't we just write a dichotomous identification key that only uses a hand lens? Because again, when you're in an urban area, the cohort of species is so reduced that it's possible to do. And you actually can do it for other areas as well. But it's actually really easy for someone that's just starting out to sort of use an illustrated glossary, which we also have included, to learn like 20 or 30 terms tops. And then have a hand lens, you go out to a tree or a rock and you can run it through this dichotomous key and it works. Very cool. This book is a really great opportunity to sort of have one more way to start to delve into the world of lichens. And it's a really amazing group of things to study. It's a really amazing group of things to look at because it really is this like layer of life that exists all around us. And like, we never really, you know, like once you start to look at them a little bit, you can't help but see other ones. So like Jesse, you know, has noticed that if you're like, okay, so when I'm, I I see this like, and I want to figure out what it is, you go with your hand lens, you like go up to it and you're looking close up and you're start and then book, you start seeing all these other lichens around it that you probably didn't even notice before. Or you start being like, oh, this one next to it. Oh, I see that it it actually is totally different. It's not the same one. And so it's like one of these things where the closer you look, the more you see, which is really, really great. So, I mean, if if you want to learn about a whole nother dimension of the biodiversity in your backyard, this is the way to do it. And and I mean, like you're saying, with once you start looking, you see so much. I mean, that's true of every thing. And I know that's been the way that I've gotten interested in a lot of the things I'm interested in is I'll get interested in one little thing or start looking at it. It's like, Ooh, and then you see yep. everything else around and all the differences. And it's like, I got to know more and more and more and more. And it's a never ending rabbit hole. And I absolutely love that about yep. nature. And, Same here. But, I, I, I haven't found the end yet. <laughs> no. And I hope never to. Yep. Indeed. <laughs> Not likely. <laughs> yes. So I will definitely in the show notes have a link to your book, and then I'll also put one in there for the Lichens of North America. Awesome. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. But yeah, if people have questions and want to learn more, can they contact you? Yep. Google Lichen and James. (laughs) Yep. For that many of us. But yeah, okay. So this has been great. Thank you again so much for talking with us. 
Of course, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really enjoyed it. It was great. And I'm just glad to be able to talk about lichens for it's probably this is the best thing I've done today for sure. Well, thanks. Yeah, this has been definitely a lot of fun for me too. Awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Yes. Well, have a great day. Bye bye. Yeah, you too. Yep. Have a good one. I really appreciate James taking time out of his busy schedule to talk with us about lichens. This was a fascinating conversation. I learned so much. The whole idea that lichens don't share a common ancestor within the fungi in the same way that all sunflowers share a common ancestor within the plants was completely mind-blowing to me. I also didn't realize before this conversation that individuals within the same lichen species could have different primary algae and cyanobacteria. I thought it was always that close one-to-one -one relationship. I love learning new things, and this episode was so full of that. The other thing that really intrigued me from our conversation is the idea that lichens can tell us something about the history of a place. I already enjoy using the plants I find to read the history of a location and find out the stories of that place. So the whole idea that lichens can just add another layer to that and help me gain even more insights just makes lichens even more fascinating to me. Even though I don't live in an urban area, I am definitely planning to order a copy of Urban Lichens, a field guide for Northeastern North America. I think it sounds like a great way to start learning more about the lichens around my home. And after today's conversation, that is something I am very interested in doing. If that sounds like something you might be interested in as well, then I encourage you to check out the book too. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to let you know about my email list. Every week I send a short email with links to the most recent Backyard Ecology blog article and podcast episode, as well as any other news of interest. It's the best way to make sure that you never miss anything in the Backyard Ecology world. If you haven't signed up, then I encourage you to do so at www.backyardecology.net slash subscribe. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.